I first speak some other time. One second. I'm going on the live stream and it just takes one second to the delay. And I need to mute it, otherwise you hear the echo. Um, speak some other time. There you go. And then uh, let me open the thing. I'm going to share my screen real quick. And then uh, you see the screen there, yeah. People usually show up right in time nowadays, so usually this takes a few minutes to. Oh, Danny's lab is there. It's good to see him. Okay. Take a look. I think it's the time is now perfect. Okay. Uh, so uh, welcome everybody. Let me uh, start the presentation here. Uh, so I would like to welcome all of you uh, to attend once again the uh, uh, SPIN Plus X, um, SPICE SPIN Plus X seminar series. As you know, it's organized here by the SPIN Phenomenon and Disciplinary Center that I lead together with Tyrone Everson City, who is now W3 professor in Duisburg, and in collaboration with the Collaborator Research Center, uh, SPIN Plus X, led by Martina Schliemann, Burka Hillebrands, and Matthias Chloe. And uh, just so you know, this is, of course, a web seminar format uh, at 3 p.m. every day. Uh, uh, the U.S. guys hopefully have gotten the message that it's one hour later than it used to be all with, uh, because of the, uh, the daylight saving times. And uh, also, uh, just to, to, to know that next week, uh, celebrating the one and a half years that we've been running, uh, Thomas Youngworth will be also giving a presentation on ultramagnetism. Um, uh, the discovery of this new type of class of magnetic uh, materials. And then uh, we'll continue on with Hideki Rivajasi uh, and Hariom uh, Yani, and the list goes on within the rest of the year that you can check out on the webpage. Uh, I'd like to, Peter Opener, uh, our speaker for today, is, uh, he got caught uh, when he visited one of the seminars as a speaker, uh, but he had been uh, one that uh, we wanted to hear for a long time here in the series. Uh, he's a very uh, well-known uh, uh, work in the theory of uh, light-induced magnetization and all optical magnetization switching, and the theory behind it uh, of optical-induced spin currents and relativistic effects, uh, particularly looking carefully uh, at, at initial theories and uh, microscopic uh, origins of, of these effects. Uh, and he's, of course, a professor at the Uppsala University. Uh, and. Uh, into that. So with this, I will stop sharing and I will ask you, Peter, to go ahead and please uh, um, go ahead and, uh, and just uh, share your screen. And now. And How's it working? Again. Perfect. It's working perfect. Okay. So, yes, thank you, Jairo. And uh, Thank you for the kind invitation. Uh, I want to talk a little bit of uh, work that we did in the uh, recent uh, few years. It is development of analytic theory for magnetization dynamics and also ab initio theory. So in the first part of this talk, I want to talk about uh, the landau lipschitz gilbert equation, which is a semi-empirical equation, but we want to make a derivation of it from fundamental principles. Uh, and doing so, we will then find that there are new torques that were not considered before. They are relativistic torques, such as the relativistic field derivative torque. And we also will get inertia, the inertia to torque that was considered before. But we also get other torques like the optical spin orbit torque. And then in the second part, uh, I want to go to app initial calculations and look what kind of calculations uh, we can do for platinum 3D metal bilayers in order to understand the origin of the spin orbit torque and the spin and orbital accumulation. So by calculating these expressions where in here we calculate these uh, magnetoelectric susceptibilities. And then in the last part, I want to look at uh, uh, symmetry broken antiferromagnet magnets like uh, copper manganese uh, arsenide and manganese to gold uh, and show what one can calculate there uh, spin and orbital raspa edelstein effects 
uh, and what new information that gives about uh, these materials. So uh, I want to thank my collaborators uh, in my small group, uh, Ritwik Mondal and Marco Berita. They did uh, uh, a lot of work on the derivation of relativistic spin dynamics. Uh, Ashish Nandi working on Rasba Edelstein effect and uh, inertial uh, dynamics and Leandro Salemi uh, has recently done calculations for uh, uh, induced, current induced spin and orbital uh, polarizations. And we have a, a close collaboration with uh, the group of Uli Novak in Constance, uh, where we collaborate on uh, not only deriving the torques, but also putting them into the practice. Uh, so let us start with uh, the first part. Uh, we want to derive relativistic torques. So the spin orbit torque is a relativistic torque how can we do that? If we look at the landau lipschitz gilbert equation here given to the left. Okay, so this here equation is semi-empirical. It was based on intuition. One can understand there are, there are two torques. They are normal to each other. Uh, this equation has a dissipative part in the damping. It is on a microsco microscopic level. It is a continuous uh, description of the magnetization. It is valid on long time scales and what people do is you take this equation you assume that it is correct and then you add torques in an ad hoc way now is there some other way to do this that is the question that we asked us uh, a few years ago uh, and then if you go to a more fundamental level you can go to the dirac consham equation now it is written here this is a four vector equation. It is fundamental, it is Hermitian. It means there is no dissipation. It describes the electronics, the electronic structure. So it is on the electronic level, it is quantized and it is valid for short time scales, auto seconds to femtoseconds. Uh, and is there any relation between these two equations? That was the question that we uh, started with. Uh, and if so, can we then use the dirac sham theory to derive uh, expressions for um, relativistic torques and possibly also for the Gilbert damping? Now, the Gilbert damping has been studied quite a lot. Uh, so many people have worked on this. Um, um, here is a list. This is the expression alpha, the Gilbert damping constant. Um, many people worked on this and uh, Kambersky was one of the first people to derive expressions for the Gilbert uh, damping constant. And this has been then uh, done in the, in the last years, starting with the torque-torque correlation model and then app initial calculations. Okay, so there are many theories already for the, for the Gilbert damping. Um, and, and it is clear that the Gilbert damping is related to the spin orbit coupling. So it is relativistic, but we had a little bit a different uh, perspective. We want to do a, a derivation starting from uh, the Konsham Dirac theory of the Gilbert damping. So if you look now at the, the Dirac Konsham equation here, so it is written here, four vector equation. This is the equation uh, that one needs. We, have, we, have, we must have the uh, external electromagnetic field. And this here is the, um, uh, the, the exchange field here, so that both of them must be there. Uh, and then one can look, this is a, a four vector equation, but we want to have only the electronic part in there. So what one normally does is a foldy Waldhausen transformation. However, this was not done before in, in the full form as it is written here. So we did this, it was done in, in this paper here, 2016. If you do then the foldy waldhausen transformation, you get uh, the non-relativistic and first order relativistic terms. Um, so they are written here. Now the expressions, they become a little bit long, uh, but you can see all the terms that uh, the, the known terms here, the, the, the um, mass renormalization term, Darwin term here, uh, the, the green block here, that is uh, a new expression for the, the relativistic spin orbit coupling with external electromagnetic fields. So this here, actually this expression contains some new terms. The blue block here is the relativistic correction to the exchange field that was actually also not considered uh, before. Uh, the expression here is still gauge invariant and it is also Hermitian. Um, now we want to look at these terms. So let us go to the, 
the external uh, spin orbit coupling term. So that was the green block. Now I have written it down here again, and we can look at it here in the first part. We have the, the, the normal intrinsic spin orbit uh, coupling, but there are new terms. Uh, if you look here, uh, E external times the vector potential also appears here. So there's two times there. So we get, we get a new coupling term in the Hamiltonian that was not known before. Uh, and if you look a little bit at it, it is a strange uh, coupling term. It has uh, the, the, the Pauli matrix sigma here. It is uh, first order relativistic in one over C square. And then it has this E cross A. What is E cross A? Actually, that is nowadays called uh, the spin of the photon. So actually, this is a very interesting equation that was not known to exist before. Here, there is a direct coupling, the spin sigma of the electron uh, with the spin of the photon. So I can, I can rewrite it a little bit in this way here, sigma dot js. And when I look then at it in this way, then you see it is actually similar to the normal spin orbit coupling. The normal spin orbit coupling uh, S dot L, uh, but now it is S dot JS, the spin of the, uh, of the photon. Okay, so if you have this new term in the Hamiltonian, we can also understand that there is going to be a new torque uh, because we can work out what the torque is going to be. It will be uh, of the form uh, M cross JS. Uh, and then we can rewrite JS uh, as it is done here on the left hand side. Uh, what you see then actually that there is going to be an, uh, an optomagnetic field um, and that this optomagnetic field working out this expression is given uh, by this term here. Uh, and then what, what one finds is that there is a new torque. So there is a torque M cross uh, B opt uh, which uh, where the optomagnetic field then will exert uh, a torque on the on the spin. This is similar to the inverse Faraday effect, and we calculate uh, calculated how large this uh, optomagnetic field can be. Uh, this exists then only if I have a photon with uh, with spin. Um, it is re relatively large in the order of millitesla, and some observation possibly was done in this Nature Photonics paper. Okay, so that was uh, one term in the Hamiltonian. Now we want to come to see if we can derive uh, the landau lipschitz gilbert equation. So we have to write down the full uh, spin Hamiltonian. Uh, and then we have to do the, the spin operator dynamics. This is the Heisenberg dynamics uh, for um, the spin operator. And then we have to calculate the magnetization by taking here a uh, trace of uh, rho and s. Uh, if one works this out now, uh, v is some chosen volume element. If one works this out, so one has to work out this trace here. This is a, a bit a longer um, calculation with this commutator here. But uh, what happens is that then actually one finds precisely the landau lipschitz uh, gilbert equation. Uh, so what does this mean now? Uh, it first means that uh, landau lipschitz gilbert equation is fully consistent with the Kohn-Sham Dirac theory. And that is actually interesting. So we can uh, we can have uh, peace when we use the landau lipschitz gilbert equation that it rests on a fundamental uh, foundation. Um, here we have now this term here. This comes from this external, what we call the external spin orbit coupling. I will work it out a little bit more in the next uh, transparency. I have to say here, this was uh, a derivation done in, in this paper. Here, you can also, as a next step, you can include currents. And then actually, if you do that, you will find uh, further terms like the, the Berger spin transfer uh, torque and so on. But let us look at uh, the Gilbert damping. Uh, something interesting happened here when we did the derivation. So we can do this. We have a harmonic driving field. Uh, and then we can work out um, this, we get this expression, but we have, of course, then we get this capital A, which is now uh, tensorial uh, Gilbert damping. And when we look at it, this is the expression here. It has an electronic damping part and it has uh, a damping part due to spin-spin correlation. So that spin-spin uh, correlation part, that is similar to what was proposed by Garata and McDonald. Uh, but in our equation, it is, it is a, a combination of the two terms. This is for uh, harmonic driving fields. 
uh, but actually we were looking what happens now if if the the driving field is not harmonic uh, then we get a different expression then actually we get uh, a term this is a now a new uh, landau lipschitz gilbert equation that was not written like this before uh, here now there is an extra term if i have a non-harmonic field so i have a time de time dependent driving field but it is non-harmonic so actually if you look at it there's now a new torque so the new torque is this m cross and then dh uh, dt this that is how it appears uh, this torque was uh, not seen before, not, not, um, it, not, it is not seen experimentally, I have to say, and it was also not uh, predicted in other work. So we worked uh, together with uh, Uli Novak to look what is the effect of this torque. Uh, you can write the LLG equation in the landau lipschitz form, and it looks a little bit different, but then if you write it, it's the, in the red block here, you have here the, the Zeeman torque, and then you have the new torque, M cross dh dt, which is the field derivative torque. So you can actually compare them, but you see there is the alpha here, uh, Gilbert damping, so it makes the, the second term smaller. However, you can see that if you are on a short time scale, then uh, this torque is going to be important and it will be there. So if I have terahertz pulses, for example, then I will have the Zeeman torque, but I will also have the field derivative torque. And with, with uh, the group of Uli Novak, uh, we did calculations um, where one can see then that if, if this torque exists, it will give uh, a, um, a, a change, it will change the magnetization um, uh, dynamics. Uh, and this torque here, if alpha is large, it can be more important. Okay, but as I said, it has not been seen so far. So this is a possibility to test the theory to see if it is uh, um, correct. Uh, then uh, inertial spin dynamics. So inertial dynamics, it was actually first uh, proposed more than 100 years ago. Uh, but it became important again. Uh, first, there was this work by Kimel et al, where inertial dynamics uh, was proposed for, for spin uh, switching, Nature Physics 2009. So the inertial dynamics, it has a new torque, m cross and then i d square m d t square. So this is the inertial term um yes so this is a proposal um, there were then after the the work that uh, uh, the work of Kimmel, there were other uh, people following up on this and developing theory for the um, inertial dynamics so that was done in the first uh, years of this uh, topic we, we took a little bit a different route we wanted to know can inertial uh, dynamics also be described by, La by the Cohn-Sham Dirac theory uh, as a higher order relativistic effect. And actually, if you do a similar derivation uh, with um, foldy Waldhausen transformation, but you go to higher orders um, in one of the C to the power of four then, uh, what happens is that uh, a new term appears. It is this term here. And if you then work out what is the, the magnetization dynamics due to this uh, part of the Hamiltonian, then actually you see there is uh, an, uh, an inertial term that uh, uh, appears. Okay, so it is possible to derive uh, the inertial torque from the Cohn-Sham Dirac uh, theory. Now, this was kind of for us uh, a bit of theory. Um, and it was not clear if there's any relation to experiments, but I have to say that um, um, what was very nice uh, in recent work by Stefano Bonetti et al. So they showed in this Nature Physics paper of this year that actually you can see a proof of uh, existing inertial dynamics uh, in, in ferromagnets. So here on the left, you see the um, spectrum. This is the the frequency here, you see the ferromagnetic resonance, if there is no inertia, but if there is inertia, you get a new peak in the spectrum. Um, and this peak, they could precisely observe for three of those uh, ferromagnets that are written here. And they also, they got uh, an approximate uh, value for this uh, capital I. Uh, so the um, inertial dynamics uh, exists, that, that is good to know. Uh, we don't we don't know if it is 
consistent with our theory, I have to say that. So we had uh, in a previous talk of Stefano Bonetti, there was uh, a little bit of discussion about that. Uh, in our paper here, we observed that if you look at the, the, the capital I here, and you have the gamma of the Tilbert tamping, there's a, a proportionality between the two. Okay, so um, it means then that um, this is some way of at least testing if our um, uh, prediction is correct. Uh, so it, it looks that it might be consistent with a recent work of uh, Stefano Bonetti. However, I have to say, uh, this is not a proof because there are other, uh, after um, the, the recent uh, development and interest in inertial dynamics, now many papers, they are regularly appearing on the archive. And I have to say that uh, in this paper here, by Pai and Nikolic, they actually showed that you can have um, inertia dynamics uh, due to damping to leads. Okay, but inertial dynamics, uh, it exists, it's important on short time scales, and it can offer new options for uh, terahertz uh, spin dynamics. And of course, uh, this is again a first observation and uh, much more work needs to be done. Now I want to come to the second part of the of my talk uh, to come to the spin orbit torques. Uh, so the motivation here was a discovery uh, in this paper here, uh, Myron and Cambardella, uh, Nature 2011, uh, a beautiful experiment. What they have here is, uh, th this is platinum here and here is cobalt. You send current pulses through the platinum, actually in this direction, and what you see then, you see nicely the switching of the cobalt. So you, you, the cobalt magnetization switches, and this was then also observed in this uh, science paper where it was done not with platinum, but with tantalum. So this here is uh, attributed to the spin hole effect of platinum or other heavy metals like uh, tungsten and tantalum. However, there, is, uh, there are two effects basically. So there is an interfacial effect that happens here and there is the, the bulk spin hole effect uh, in the uh, heavy metal. Uh, and we wanted to distinguish uh, these two. Let me mention that uh, the chairman has written uh, a review on the spin hole effect. And there's also a, a recent review on spin orbit torques. Um, so if one looks at uh, the spin accumulation that can happen if we have a bilayer, there are two sources. Yeah, it is uh, both of the sources, they are charged to spin conversion, but there is, of course, there is the spin hole effect. I have transport as it is shown here then, and the spin hole effect gives a, a spin accumulation, uh, spin up on this side, spin down on the other side, uh, as was predicted uh, years ago. Uh, and this is fact, in, in fact, what people do is you do calculations for infinite uh, bulk crystals. There is another effect, which is called inverse spin galvanic effect or Rashba Edelstein effect. Uh, this is uh, different. I have again a current or an applied electric field. Now the spin polarization happens locally. It is not due to transport, but locally. So there is some uh, induced uh, spin polarization due to the electric field and there's a magnetoelectric susceptibility uh, that connects the two. So this was predicted by Einstein, Edelstein, sorry, Edelstein on the, on the basis of uh, Rasmus spin orbit coupling, but this was done for a, a 2D material. Okay, so now we wanted to look what are the sizes of these two contributions and what can we learn? So we, uh, we want to calculate these effects. Uh, what we do is we use linear response theory formulation. So here, uh, but it is a little bit different from what other people have done. So basically this is the uh, induced magnetization here. Um, but, uh, and this is the linear response expression here where this, this capital A is the, the operator that uh, comes in here. Um, this A, uh, we do it in the following way that it can be the, the orbital angular momentum or the spin angular momentum. So we, we compute both the induced spin momentum, spin polarization and the induced orbital polarization. So basically we have two equations um, like this where we have two susceptibilities. Yeah. 
spin magnetoelectric and orbital magnetoelectric susceptibilities. Okay, so that is the, um, um, if you won't trust by Edelstein effect, uh, we, we have then also the spin hall effect that we can calculate and the orbital hall effect, where now the, the, the expressions, they are similar here. P is the, uh, the momentum matrix element. Okay, so the expressions, they are similar, um, but now in this case, we put in uh, the anti-commutator here of uh, spin and momentum operators. Uh, and this we can do again for spin and also for the, uh, for the orbital current operator. Uh, we were not the first ones to do this, I have to say that. So uh, the spin hall effect, it was uh, first calculated by Gu et al. In, in this paper. Orbital hall effect was first calculated uh, Tanaka et al. 2008. And there are some recent calculations, uh, uh, but this is just one publication. Actually, there are now many publications uh, coming on the orbital hall effect. We, we implemented this in uh, relativistic mean to K code. So we want to look at spin orbitals at symmetry broken interfaces, uh, typically platinum. And then there is here uh, um, uh, on top of platinum, some 3D ferromagnet. So this is our system here that we use in the calculations. Uh, we have 16 platinum layers, and then we have two layers on top of this. Uh, here, actually, these two layers, they can be either nickel, cobalt, copper, or platinum. Uh, this is the, the Z direction, uh, but the current we take in plane. So the current is going to be in this direction. And then we want to look what uh, the torques uh, will be. So I have to evaluate this expression here, where basically this delta B comes from the induced spin polarization. Uh, and the induced spin polarization is connected to this uh, tensor element uh, in this way. If I have, um, I can have now, the, that is an interesting aspect here. Um, this here, it turns out that the, the tensor elements that are non-zero, there are several tensor elements that are non-zero. Uh, and I will explain that in a moment. Uh, okay, so we calculate these elements and then we can work out what are the spin orbit torques uh, by substituting this. Uh, and then we find two spin orbit torques and an odd one uh, that is odd in magnetization and also time reversal odd. This is uh, what is called the field-like spin orbit torque. So we can calculate it from this expression. And then we have the even torque uh, where this here is uh, time reversal even. And this is uh, um, the, typically the, the damping-like tor torque. Now I have to say that uh, we were not the first ones to do this. So the earliest wor work maybe on calculating these torques was uh, Hani et al. And then also uh, Freimuth, Blügel and Mukrusov were calculating these torques. And meanwhile, there have been quite a number of uh, calculations. Uh, so we have uh, different tensor elements that are non-zero. Uh, so let us look, here is now um, this here, what we see here, this is the atomic layer, the index of the atomic layer. So one to 16, 16 platinum, and then we have 17 and 18. These are the, the 3D uh, metals or platinum. So we calculate here the, the spin um, current, spin tensor, spin current tensor. Uh, and this is the spin accumulation here. So this here is transverse spin accumulation. I have my current in one direction and I get uh, a transverse spin accumulation. This here, if we look a little bit at the shape here, um, the shape in the, of this uh, orange curve, this is for pure platinum. What we see here, this curve is typically what I um, expect to get if I have uh, uh, drift, and I will get the accumulation on the sides of the material. So this comes now out of the app initial calculation. So it is typically similar to what we have from, from uh, a spin drift equation. Now we can also see if we have those other materials here, we have an interface, then there is a modification. The, the modification happens here around the interface. Um, this effect does not depend on the magnetization. So I can reverse the magnetization of the, of the cobalt and the nickel, it will not change. So this is M and T even effect. 
So this is uh, the typical uh, spin accumulation that one expects in the spin hole effect. Now this here, this component that actually was not um, discussed much. Uh, this is an unusual component that is also non-zero. Uh, this here, this delta x s x. This here is a spin polarization that occurs along the e direction. And what you see here, this is a very local, uh, very local response. So it happens only the interface is basically here. So this spin polarization happens locally at the interface. Uh, it is not in what is typical for the spin hall effect because the spin hall effect, you would expect a transverse spin accumulation, but here it happens along the, the E direction. And what you see, maybe not, okay, you see what you see here, it is zero for platinum, uh, platinum uh, copper is zero. It only appears if I have a magnetic material. If I change the magnetization, it will uh, flip the, the sign. Okay, so this is M and T odd. Uh, the sign, the, the size, sorry, the size here is not so small. It is uh, comparable to what I have uh, here. So this here is an uh, unusual uh, effect that was um, not discussed in, in, in this way. Um, and we were struggling with uh, the reviewer for uh, a year. Um, so this here, we, we called this the magnetic spin hole effect. Uh, this here, uh, the magnetic spin hole effect, this name was actually proposed in, in, the, in this paper, Kimata et al, uh, Nature. Uh, 2019. It is it is clear that this is not the normal spin hole effect. It is something different. But I have to say that our ab initio calculations, yeah, they should uh, include uh, all the effects, uh, and they they tell us what is the the spin accumulation if we are in the stationary state. Okay, so that is what we could learn from those calculations. Now. We can also do the same thing, and we go to the uh, the orbital part. Um, here, this is the the this is a lay, now layer specified uh, the orbital Hall effect. So what we see here, the first thing is that the orbital Hall effect is very large. Uh, this is consistent with uh, previous uh, papers uh, where people found a very large orbital Hall effect. Uh, now we can also look at the transverse orbital accumulation that is given here. So we can look here, orange, this is platinum, this orange here. Now, if we compare, uh, let me see if I, I can go back here, you see this orange shape here. This is very different from the shape that we have here. Uh, and we can understand why this is, but basically what we, what we see here is that orbital accumulation is very different from spin accumulation. So it is completely flat here in this central part. Uh, and the reason is that there is the crystal field potential that kills the orbital polarization when we have a cubic material. Uh, here, when we have now those, um, uh, the, the top layers here, actually here we get a large, we have a broken inversion symmetry here, and we get a, a large orbital uh, accumulation uh, on this side again. Now we can also look at uh, the transverse, M transverse, we call this uh, components. So these are the unusual ones uh, that are al along the, the E field. Uh, they also exist. You can see them here. They are actually not as large uh, as what we had for the spin case. Uh, they are again here, they are uh, magnetization dependent. So if I ha don't have magnetization here, it is just simply zero. Uh, but if I have a magnetic material, they appear here. They are M and T odd. So we, we decided to call this uh, the, the magnetic orbital Hall effect. It is not the same as the orbital Hall effect that was discussed uh, uh, in some previous papers. Now, what I did not tell you here, and I did not show you this in detail, in the calculations, we can switch on and switch off uh, the spin orbit uh, coupling. Uh, if you switch off the spin orbit coupling, uh, practically everything, everything that I have here, everything disappears. So there is no spin accumulation anymore. Uh, but 
the, the orbital Hall effect, it stays. Yeah, it is not due to spin orbit coupling and also the orbital uh, accumulation uh, stays. But all the other terms, they are in, induced uh, from the, uh, the orbital effect due to spin uh, orbit coupling. Okay, so let us go on uh, to um, the last part. Uh, we wanted to look at uh, uh, the inversion symmetry broken antiferromagnets. So there was a, a beautiful paper. Many people will agree with me. Uh, this uh, paper here, Watley et al. in Science, uh, 2016. Uh, copper manganese arsenide, antiferromagnet without, uh, with, with uh, broken inversion symmetry. Um, what was done in this paper is that you you uh, drive current pulses uh, through the material and then you beautifully you see with each pulse you see how it switches and there was a, a mechanism proposed in the in this paper uh, uh, the mechanism by uh, Jakob Selesny and uh, collaborators here that there isn't a staggered spin orbit torque okay this this staggered spin orbit torques shown here uh, due to the inversion symmetry breaking uh, locally there will be a spin orbit torque on in one direction on one of the manganese atoms and in the other direction on the other manganese uh, atoms so if i drive the current nicely i will see uh, switching uh, of the magnetization due to this staggered spin orbit torque uh, and this was then also observed for an other material without inversion symmetry uh, manganese to gold in this uh, nature communications paper um, a small difference here is that you see here you see this switching but what is needed is you need quite a bit of pulses in order to to switch so we wanted to um, uh, understand better uh, this mechanism uh, um, doing app initial calculations so i would like to summarize them here uh, a little bit so this is um, for copper manganese arsenide in this case what i'm showing you here this is the, the moments of the antiferromagnet along the c-axis uh, normally they are in the basal plane but i, I show this just for 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 um, pinpointing a, a big effect so the the um, electric field is uh, is in the basal plane uh, and then we can compute the full tensor so this is the magnetoelectric tensor. We can calculate the induced spin and orbital uh, um, polarizations that we get due to the electric field. And we do this uh, in frequency dependent. Um, so what we uh, find here, uh, and that is quite interesting, if you look at uh, the spin part, so the spin part here, this is completely, uh, this is staggered. You have to look, you have, the, the red curve here, manganese one, the blue curve, manganese two, they are completely uh, uh, the same with a minus sign. So the, the, this here, this is going to give a staggered torque, spin torque, precisely as was uh, said in the paper by uh, Jakob Selesny and collaborators. Uh, but interesting, uh, and that was something new, and that is what, that, so this here, this, you can call this the spin Raspar Edelstein effect. But then we also calculated the orbital polarization. Uh, and you can call this the orbital Raspar Edelstein effect. If you look now at the numbers, you see this 80 here and you see a 2 here. This tells you that the, the induced orbital polarization uh, is huge. Yeah? In this case, it is 40 times larger. I have to say that it, it depends a little bit on. Uh, uh, on the lifetime broadening that you take. Yeah, we, we took a, a rather large lifetime broadening. If I take a smaller lifetime broadening, uh, what is going to happen is that this, this 40 will be 100. Yeah, it will be 100 times larger. So the, uh, the dominant term actually uh, that happens in these materials is the, the, uh, the induced orbital polarization due to the orbital uh, Raspar Edelstein effect. And we can also, and we did, looking at the, the scaling with the spin orbit interaction. And then you find this, this term here, the orbital Raspar Edelstein effect, it is not um, depending on the spin orbit coupling. So it is is there even without spin orbit coupling. But all the other terms that are here, they are induced due to spin orbit coupling. Uh, what we also found is that uh, this, this, these are the staggered terms. However, there are quite large, 
uh, terms that are non-staggered. So these are actually, uh, in this case, diagonal tensor elements. So you can look here, this yx2, but this y, maybe we should take this in xx, uh, is of the same level. So they are, there are large uh, non-staggered elements that are also, also present. If you then look, what is now the kind of symmetry that I get? So I can look, the, this, the direction is the E field, and then this little red arrow is the, the induced polarization for the orbital part here. We always, we get almost a perfect uh, rush bar symmetry because this, this, uh, this part here, this is so large, the, the staggered orbital part. If you look at the spin part, it is different. The spin part now, this, this is not uh, perfectly uh, rush bar, it is still rush bar-like, but the, the, the vectors here, they are turned, and this is because of those non-staggered elements. Okay, so let us look at another case. This is manganese two gold with moments in the basal plane. Um, okay, so here we have similar uh, calculations. Um, here the, the, the induced uh, spin polarization, the induced orbital polarization, and again, what one has, of course, is that these off-diagonal uh, components of the uh, magnetoelectric susceptibility, they are, uh, uh, they are staggered in, in manganese and manganese 2 gold. Um, now, again, we have a little bit different. We have non-staggered elements here that are, again, they are quite large, non-staggered elements. Um, if one now puts together this, these elements and these elements, then actually what happens is that this can change the symmetry that you have. In this case, now you don't have a rush bar like symmetry for the spin part anymore, but it is it now becomes uh, what is called uh, Dressel house like uh, symmetry. The orbital part, however, is different because again, uh, the, the, uh, the staggered parts parts are uh, the main ones and they stay even if I switch off spin orbit interaction. Uh, we can understand why this, sorry, we can understand why we have uh, here this, um, this perfect anti-symmetry. You can show that if you have PT symmetry, which is uh, preserved in this material as was pointed out uh, already before us. But if you take the, uh, the induced uh, orbital moment on manganese one, Due to PT symmetry, it must be the, the one on manganese two must have a, a minus sign. Okay, so this was what we found in this paper, uh, 2019, that actually the, the orbital Raspar Edelstein effect is the, the dominating one. Um, and that there are these uh, uh, non staggered elements. So we uh, uh, now, if you look at the non-staggered elements here for these cases here, so manganese one and manganese two, they are on top of each other. So they give the same response. Uh, and what was interesting uh, is that um, uh, this year, actually, uh, a paper came out, um, which is shown here, obs observation of the anti-ferromagnetic spin hole effect. That is how these uh, authors called the effect, Nature Materials 2021. Here there is manganese two gold. There is cobalt palladium, so an out-of-plane ferromagnet on top of it. You drive a current through manganese to gold, and you see a spin polarization that is not the normal spin hall effect. The normal spin hall effect would give a spin accumulation in the plane, but it gives here out-of-plane. And this out-of-plane uh, spin accumulation, this then can make a, a switch of the, of the magnetization of this ferromagnet on top of the manganese to gold. Um, so basically, if you go back here, if you look at these uh, um, um, elements that are um, non-staggered, uh, actually they, they, in this case, both the, the manganese one and manganese two, they will uh, produce a, a spin accumulation in the Z direction. So that is, uh, at least this is consistent what, uh, with what was seen in this paper. So they can, uh, they might, they are, it seems that these non-staggered elements are there and they can play a role, they can be used, but this was proposed in, in, in not by us in this paper, that they can be used for uh, uh, field-free switching. Now we are almost at 45 minutes, so I would like to uh, summarize. 
um, saying that uh, in the first part, uh, we could show that if I take now the landau lipschitz gilbert equation, then it is totally okay to work with this equa equa uh, equation because it is standing on, on a solid foundation, which is the dirac Concham theory. Uh, and driving that a little bit further, you can find uh, new relativistic spin orbit torques, as I showed, field derivative torque for time-dependent fields, optical spin orbit torque. We can derive expressions for um, the uh, uh, intrinsic inertial torque. Uh, and having now these different expressions, it also means that we can extend the landau lipschitz gilbert equation to shorter timescales because these torques, they are active on short timescales. Then um, in, we showed, uh, we looked at the um, uh, platinum 3D uh, bilayers and showed that there are actually two interesting different uh, polarizations uh, arising, uh, which we called uh, new terms, mag mag magnetic spin hall effect and orbital hall effect. Uh, and that the orbital accumulation is quite different from what we know for spin accumulation. Uh, both terms that we have along the X and the Y direction are, uh, are relevant for switching. Okay, and if, if you go to the uh, anti-ferromagnets, uh, the, the main message was there is that the orbital Rasmus edelstein effect is huge. It is, is there, it is locally on the atoms, is not due to spin orbit coupling, but to the broken symmetry. Uh, and there are also uh, non-staggered elements that could be of importance. So with that, I would like to say, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. We have an applause for the audience. Yeah? <laughs> <laughs> I could hear something. There you go. Uh, so thank you very, very much. Uh, so we are happy to take questions from the audience. Uh, and then I'll promote to whoever is asking questions to panelists, so you can ask directly to uh, to Peter, and I have some questions myself. Um, I think Mark is there, and uh, Sasha Sik is there, so I'm going to promote them there. Let's see if uh, oh Sik, for some reason Mark has not been promoted yet. Uh, so Sasha, can you go ahead and ask your question? Uh, unmute yourself and ask the question. Okay. Can you hear me? Uh, can yes. you hear me? Can yeah, you hear we can hear you. We can hear you. All right. Well, if we call, can go back to the very first uh, issue, the consistency of the LG with the constant Dirac. I, I'm a bit confused by the delivery, uh, but may, maybe it's just due to the, the presentation. No, no, we go to the first one. Uh, but the, where uh, the constant Dirac uh, equation. Um, this equation. Hmm? Uh, uh, well, Maybe I'm just, I'm really confused because normally when we consider the Dirac equation in the external field, whether in the just external field or including the exchange correlation terms, this form, the last term is already an approximation. Yeah. So after we do the, we, we have only the vector potential, which you have. Hmm. And then you, in addition, you have this BXC. Mm -hmm. So this 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 form actually comes as an approximation that your yeah your you, 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 your spin is coupled only to the spin part yeah, of yeah, the yeah, yeah. Uh, Sasha potential. Sasha yeah, yes, yes. It, 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 Sasha it is is a very good question, and it is something I I jumped over it. Okay, uh, I jumped over it for a certain reason, um, but let me explain it. So I believe that that this is the the uh, um, the form that is normally now assumed to be correct, but there is something that is special. Uh, and what happened is that people, so you have here the exchange fields uh, and people have tried to put the exchange field in here. Yeah, so you, you would make a vector potential of the exchange field and not keep it in, in the way that it is written here. Um, the problem is, and actually Helmut Eschrich, he was quite a bit uh, doing on this, but, but anyhow, so the, the exchange field is not a Maxwellian field. The exchange field is not source free. So what happens is that the exchange field actually behaves in a different way from the, what is the normal magnetic field in here. Uh, and therefore, 
so far, I, I know that some people have tried, uh, Patrick Bruno and other people, they tried to put the, this uh, in here. Um, uh, I, I think that it, it was not successful, um, but, but I, I, I agree with you that there is still something to be done uh, to, if possible. But we have not found uh, a proper exchange field that we can put in here and we would have an exchange uh, vector potential. Okay, so in this way, yes, you are correct. If I write it like this, on purpose, I kept the exchange field out of there. Uh, uh, and, and there are still questions. Um, um, how to do it? Uh, okay, so there is another paper, uh, but in one of the papers, actually we discussed this. Maybe it was also in this one. Uh, uh, suppose you put the exchange field in here and then you work this out. And what then going, is going to happen is that the exchange field, it will not work on the spin, but it will work on the orbital. And there is a difference. Yeah, the Zeeman field, it works on the spin and the orbital part but the exchange field only works on the spin part. But this is already an approximation. This is, no, a no, no. Le, no, this is a fundamental approximation because if you do it like this, you immediately put yourself in the, in the reference frame which sits on the electrode. Hmm. That's why this thing works only without the current. Hmm. Uh, okay, I, I think, we can discuss it. Uh, yes, we can yes, discuss it yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, so let me move uh, to Mark, who has his hand uh, first. So Mark Auslander, you can maybe unmute yourself and ask a question. Um, let me see, I'm not sure if he's available to unmute himself. Okay. So let's try it with, I think instead, let's try then with Juan, Juan David uh, Jaramillo. Can you unmute yourself and ask a question? Or should I, yeah, go ahead. Good, thank you, Professor Haido. Good morning, Professor Peter. So greetings Hello. from Colombia. So, um, hello, Professor Peter. So, um, my question, um, I have two small questions. So, the first question is that you mentioned that you would like to consider shorter time scales. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, um, I, I'm, I'm wondering if you want to consider shorter time scales, if the approach you're proposing here has any limitations regarding... Uh, the fact that the, the equation is Hermitian and stuff like that, would you have to consider open quantum system dynamics if you're going to go to shorter time scales? So that's uh, my first question. And the second question will be, so what will happen if you consider like more complicated dynamics? So what will be the, the limitations of this approach in terms of the characteristic energy scale uh, for the coupling between light and matter and stuff like that. Mm. Right, Juan David, good questions. Yes, okay, open quantum systems. There indeed, uh, things can be different and that was actually uh, pointed out in, in this paper by Pai Nikolic. Um, there we would have, have a, a different kind of um, inertia um, which it has to do with the open quantum system. So that basically it is, uh, uh, it is what happening is the dissipation to the leads. And then if you talk about general time scales, okay, um, uh, I cannot precisely say at what limit we would be. Uh, what happens is, of course, the, the driving pulses. Uh, here we were talking about terahertz pulses and the terahertz pulse, it works, it is still the, the, the magnetic field of the pulse that works on the spin. But if I go to even shorter pulses, what then happens is that of course, the, the E field of the light uh, is, going to, uh, is going to work on the electron and it will create uh, uh, a state that is um, um, a, a different electronic state. Um, there, I think we will uh, we will reach uh, limitations. Uh, so I, I will not say that this is included in the treatment. Uh, basically, here, here we we are not directly at. Uh, this is the 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 coupling of the 
the angular momentum of the light to the electron spin. Okay, so here this coupling should be there. Uh, it might also be affected if if I have uh, if I go to a, a very um, uh, out of equilibrium electronic excitation. So we, we have to be careful that we we, we do not uh, go, go too far. So the the, the terahertz pulses should be okay. Um, beyond that, uh, we will need to look into it. Okay. 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 Yeah, yeah, I was just uh, perhaps thinking that in some work, mm -hmm. like something that we did, and and of course what Henin did with Jonas. Yeah. So um, there, uh, if you extend the the picture a little bit, maybe one will have to consider like a reservoir of photons for some shorter time scales. Mm -hmm. something like this. So then, and then the system will become mm, like effectively open. And here okay. gonna, yeah, like, yeah. Right. Thing. Okay. Uh, uh, yeah, Juan David, it, it's a good remark. And um, uh, it this also brings me then to the point, um, maybe I can say this now, but because we, we were looking at the damping. Um, uh, let me see here. G -g -g -g. Uh, was it? No, not this one. Sorry. Uh, here. Now, of course, uh, what can happen is that there are phonons or other uh, quasi-particles uh, that would give an uh, additional uh, contribution to the damping. Okay, so the we have to be honest and say that we have understood one part of, of how this derivation could work, but there can be other uh, contributions. In, in this case, uh, phonons, but the same could happen with photons. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I was just uh, wondering what will be a natural extension that one can approach from the non-equilibrium perspective. So yeah, I mean, this usually when you do the experiments, you have this inhomogeneous contribution that comes from this path to the phone, so that's hard to calculate. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you very much, Professor Peter. Okay. Thank you. Uh, let's go with Antropov. You have a question. Oh, yes. Hello, uh, Peter. Hi, this is Vladimir Antropov. Hi, Vladimir. How are you? <laughs> yeah, uh, it's good. I sit in the dark here, but because now, now at, at three o'clock it becomes dark here <laughs> in Sweden. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's Sweden. Only in summer you can kind of live there, as I was told, in Stockholm. <laughs> yeah, yeah. This uh, the, uh, in summer it it is uh, light at two o'clock in the morning. Oh, great. So okay. uh, I have a question about also initial slide when you have this Hamiltonian. It's like uh, first uh, question. Maybe yeah, this, th this one. So oh, yeah. I, I fully agree that uh, you already made some approximation about current and so on, and it could be significant, but I don't know precisely. But even this Hamiltonian already cannot be solved in Dirac equation be, uh, in Benz uh, structure theory. You have mm -hmm. to make approximation one over C squared already. Yeah. So you can write uh, all those uh, corrections beyond C squared, but mm -hmm. when you actually solve band structure problem, radial equation and so on, you cannot coupling is in, like infinite and you cannot uh, solve yeah. it beyond one over C squared. So mm -hmm. my question is, uh, what is uh, exactly an advantage of using so-called Dirac uh, formalism mm. in in the magnetic field relative to just spin orbital uh, treatment with yeah. the magnetic yeah. field if you don't study right. let's yeah. say relativistic wave function splitting and just mm -hmm. study magnetism do you see any yeah, uh, yeah. effects there because uh, it, i don't know about any yes, so how yes. about you uh, vladimir is is a good question is a good question yes and maybe i i, I should have pointed it out more so you, you can do uh, Pauli Hamiltonian in, in one over C square. Yeah, and then you would think, is it the same or is it not? It turns out it is not the same as the one that we got. Uh, because the Pauli uh, Hamiltonian in one over C square used by many people, uh, it is not gauge invariant. And if you're not careful, it is also not Hermitian. Uh, but this here, uh, actually, it is written here at the at the bottom. This one is gauge invariant and Hermitian. If you take out a term, uh, if you take out some term here, 
you you uh, you lose your gauge invariance and and also hermeticity. Um, okay, so uh, there is an advantage, uh, and that is really that. Um, it, so this here, this is the correct form, uh, as we believe, if I go to one over c square from the Dirac equation. Uh, and, and one further advantage, uh, so the, ju not just doing Pauli equation plus spin orbit interaction and one over c square, uh, one further advantage is really you get this new term here. Uh, it was not seen before. Yeah, we had e really emails from people that had worked on uh, relativistic electrodynamics, and they said they had not seen this term before. If you take out this term, the gauge invariance disappears. Uh, and, and okay, so you might say, okay, uh, if I if I do a band structure calculation, then it does not matter. Yeah, if I do a band structure calculation, I have no uh, external fields. This this will disappear. But it is nonetheless important that it is there and it comes out of the equation and it gives this coupling, uh, the photon spin to the spin of the electron. Okay, so we believe there is an advantage of doing it like this. It gives you new insight and also what, what you keep is uh, these kind of fundamental properties, uh, gauge invariant and uh, hem hem uh, that the hem Hamiltonian is Hamitian. Let me say now also uh, regarding uh, the, the question by Sasha Schick. Um, so here we, we had this term over here, uh, and many people have done it like this. Uh, it's important to keep in mind that if we then continue, uh, so this gives me uh, an effective B exchange. However, if we look at the damping um, here, so, so this part, I'm sorry. T, 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 t. Uh, okay, it was not good, but um, okay. So, so the, the, the damping comes from this part. So the exchange field is actually in this term. Okay, so the treatment of the exchange field will not change anything for the damping. Okay. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, okay let's go with Sumit. Uh, you have a question. Hi. Uh, so I want to ask about when you do the derivation for the, the damping term, you're still using a Hermitian matrix, right? Yeah, the, now, now that, is, uh, that is a very good point. And uh, what I was doing is I was trying to keep in within 45 minutes. <laughs> okay. Yes. Yes. But that is. Good. I'll go that even is, slower. Let's that say. is. That is an important point, and you mm -hmm. have correctly seen it. The point is, um, we have, we have uh, over here, we have a Hermitian Hamiltonian. Mm -hmm. Now we write the spin part because we want to look at the spin dynamics. This Hamiltonian we can show with the, the correct terms for the external spin orbit coupling. It is still Hermitian. Uh, you go to these papers and you will see that we prove that the, the Hamiltonian is Hermitian. So how can we ever get damping? The point is that we look at the spin uh, and actually we have a complete Hilbert space. And in the complete Hilbert space, everything is Hermitian. But then we take the spin in a restricted part of the Hilbert space and we, we move the spin there. Uh, and then actually there is something that creates the damping. Yeah, because the rest of the Hilbert space, it will act as a bath. Mm -hmm. And then and then we can have the, the dissipation. Uh, if we would look at uh, the operator dynamics in complete Hilbert space, it is again, it, uh, it, the Hamiltonian of that will be Hermitian. But once we work out this and we restrict our um, operator to, to the spin part, um, and this is what is kind of moved in, uh, in, a, in a restricted part of the Hilbert space. Then there is the exchange between the, the parts of the Hilbert space. And then it, it becomes uh, dissipative. So roughly speaking, what do you consider here as a reservoir? 
it, could it be the phono yeah. or the orbital moments actually you you uh, correctly you can say it is uh, the orbital part uh, in hilbert space okay and is it the only uh, dominating mechanism or there can be some electronic relaxation as well yeah. now i'm not completely sure uh, what do you mean? Uh, so, um, uh, well, I mean, orbits are, uh, mm -hmm. it's electronic. Yeah, that's true. What I mean is, let's say, when you hit this the system with laser, you basically okay. excite it. And yeah, then yeah. they can run like randomly, and then also they can just lose some energy and de-excite to a lower energy state. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think you can model this scattering like the paper Gerrit Bauer and Sarkovnia proposed, but I don't find any literature on what happens if the electron electrons uh, spontaneously come back to a lower energy state. Uh, so I have to say that um, um, on this level of the formalism here, we have not studied it. Okay. Uh, of course, we have studied um, um, laser excitations with hot electrons and hot spin currents and so on. Mm -hmm. um, normally, you take a different formalism. So at this point, um, we, we have nothing that we can say that, that we know how to uh, include uh, at, at this point... Uh, what is the effect of the, the laser excitation on the electron gas? Okay. So that actually also brings us back then to the, the, the time scale uh, uh -huh. that we, we yes. could possibly describe. So there is still something to, to be done there. Okay, thank you. So thank you. Um, let's see, I think I asked Mark Ausler, but I think this is not, uh, um, maybe you can type his question if I, if I has a question. But I have some questions, actually. I'm very curious okay. uh, uh, for many things. This is really nice. Uh, I'm actually, from the first one, when you were okay. saying about this new term, the new term that you were mentioning on the... Is it good? Sorry. Okay. Let me mute uh, Martin. Martin was chatting about. Um, a, that, that term that you said uh, from this, that is new in terms of the spin orbit carbon term, um, yeah, which one do you mean? Um, uh, actually, let me let me share something <laughs> to see if I am. So let me let me can you let me share something? Yeah, uh, do stop share. Yeah, yeah, and then I'm gonna share something of, of mine just to see if, if you can. So so here I don't know if you see the, the one I'm sharing. This okay is the okay. One. So in uh, this yes, but okay now I can see it. Can you see? Okay. So, okay. Uh -huh. so in this equation itself, when you look at this term, which is pi in this case is p minus. I'm going to say, yeah. Is that mm -hmm. from your term or? Uh, that should be one of the terms. That should be one of the terms. Uh, now this okay. this looks, uh, Jairo, this looks, this looks good. Well, I mean, this is uh, just simply the derivation. All, all it is, is just the, the, the one over MC square that I did in a chapter on a spin over coupling effects in, in a semiconductors a while ago with Alan. Yeah, I just simply simply took yes, the uh, equation and then just did the one RMC square expansion. So none okay. of the exchange things would be there of, of your sort. But so I was if, curious if because it, you had that, that term. What is the difference in that with that type of term? Uh, so if you have, it depends what you have in the pi. You have the p minus pi is the, p minus c. The pi is the, the, the what you would define. Then is then above actually this is uh, uh, actually is exactly what you define to be. Actually, uh, then with a gauge field, yeah? as I have it up here. Uh, yeah, yes. I, sorry. Uh, and this is, is, the, is the gauge, you know, the, the one with the gauge is P minus, mm -hmm. yeah, I is, is P minus E. Yeah, e, yeah, e, yeah, yeah. E, that's uh, okay. So, um, so, is, so is, at the end of the day, it's just an expansion, a one of MC square expansion. That, uh, I uh, wonder how you how you got it because you did not do Foldy Waldhausen. No, no, but this is this is a very simple calculation. I can forward you the chapter. Okay, okay, okay. This, of uh, course, we didn't. I didn't put it because I thought this was just a textbook. So, <laughs> yeah, uh, but um, uh, but I can I can forward to you. Okay, the, so uh, so Jairo, yeah. what you need to do is is to look if it is Hermitian, mm -hmm. and if it is gauge invariance. Well, it is because it is just simply an expansion. I'll show it to you. It's, it, it is actually an, actually. It's yeah, not it's not what I did, actually, it's just actually from another book, I think. That I followed uh, on the Dirac equation and derivation. Mm -hmm. but the, I'm just curious to see if it's that because okay, I so thought it's like, okay, it's just a one over since expansion. 
And uh, how come, I mean, I thought these terms, maybe they, they would have been used for sure, maybe not in the in the initial calculations, as you say, uh, but from the point of view of expanding uh, uh, tricks, I'll, I'll forward you to see, because I'm just curious uh, to see. Yeah, do uh, that. Um, uh, anyway, not, 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 I'm not claiming anything, because I didn't do anything with it, other than just algebraic derivation, okay? okay? Yeah. Right. I will look at it. Yeah. Um, okay. I'm just curious so, to see. So it maybe, maybe. Like, okay. But yeah. I, I actually interpreted it to be just the spin of the coupling, the normal one. Uh, I didn't realize that there was mm -hmm. anything different from it. Um, okay. But let me ask you so, what, can you go share your screen again? Sorry. Uh, yes, we don't. So I was like, I, think I derived something like this. Okay. <laughs> it's funny. <laughs> When when I when I used to do anything, I now I now I am not capable of doing such things. Um, so when when looking, I was very fascinated by the um, now by the by the now this this uh, this orbital Rasp Einstein effect. Yeah. Uh, essentially, a mm -hmm. stagger one contribution to the stagger uh, nail spin over torque or in that yeah. sense. Um, so in this one, the, one quick thing that I wanted to to emphasize or, or, or take you your take on it. When you talk about non-central symmetric systems, I mean, mm. uh, copper manganese arsenide and, and manganese to ball are central symmetric, but you mean okay. whenever you have the magnetic order yes, yes, that is yes. breaking the central symmetry. Uh, yeah. Correct. So, I mean, actually, this one wasn't so clear because at the beginning we thought this was the reason for these things to appear. And it may be, this is why I'm very curious on my question that I'm following up to. Mm. Uh, we, you know, Zunger actually, Alex and ourselves, Came up at the same time with this idea that these things will appear even without spin of without the magnetic. We thought at the beginning that it was due to the to the magnetic order in breaking the symmetry that it mm -hmm. appeared when he did the calculation. But even turning that off is still there. This, but he actually wow. then he didn't connect it to the nail spin of the torque whatsoever. But uh, eventually we connected to these calculations uh, showing that mm -hmm. it is now the orbital one. Is that dependent? on the magnetic order. Like if you turn off magnetic order in your system and you calculate the Edelstein effect, uh, you will likely see it. And this is essentially what he was talking right, about right, of these right, textures, right. of the spin one for sure. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, have you tried turning off yeah, the yeah, magnetic right, order right. for the orbital one and what would happen? Mm -hmm. Uh, spin orbit coupling, yes. I'm I'm looking a little. I'm bit talking about the, the, the no no the, not the spin orbit coupling, but the magnetic order. Yeah 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 uh, yeah. Uh, I know what you mean. Um, yeah. Uh, I have to say we had some other calculations for other materials, yeah. and I have to dig into them. Okay. Uh, because uh, the, the question can be answered, but I sure. have to look at it. Okay. Um, okay, so. This we have to dig into it. At, at the moment, uh, I cannot give you a definite yeah. answer. Um, maybe, maybe discuss but, it with uh, the students. They may have looked at it already uh, on it. Um, I would be very curious to see what happens. Yeah. Even yeah. for both for the spin hole, we definitely when we calculate, we only calculated the spin uh, or, or the nail or the staggered. Um, yeah. That's why it is an effect effectively, uh, and there you can actually show that. It was not so dependent as we wrote also on the paper in this uh, very simple uh, with Thomas' idea, of course, uh, um, that it was it was just coming from this local part. Mm -hmm. uh, now the uh, the orbital one, yeah, they are very very curious, and it could be that it uh, dominates, of course, as you as you calculate it. That would mm -hmm. be. And is that uh, is that the you you show that it depends now a lot on the orientation of the nail order parameter, right? Is that what he was showing? That is also uh, that is. I did not highlight it here, but okay. but if I take the uh, the nail order parameter and I change it, then these um, susceptibilities they are going to change. Okay, because so, so, so it depends on that. Okay, so because for us in this case, it didn't depend so much in our calculations so because the idea, okay. of course, in there that. Uh, uh, if it was local in the spin rush bar, it would just be, you know, essentially the current itself defines the Edelstein effect, uh, the direction, and this is why the why you could switch it. Otherwise, it uh, no, no, actually, that is that is not what we found. So, so yeah, it yeah. actually it, it depends quite a bit. Okay, wonderful. Actually, that's that's, that's against our intuition. Yeah. And, I yeah, mean, yeah. we did the calculations not in Avinisha, but with tie binding, uh, yeah. and then that we'd be curious to analyze that back. Um, yeah. yeah. Regarding your first question, yeah. So the 
orbital hall effects, uh, it is uh, it is there if I have a light metal, mm -hmm. yeah, a non-magnetic light metal. Okay. So here, orbital Raspar Edelstein effect. Um, I think if I have inversion symmetry broken locally uh, on the atom mm -hmm. and no magnetism, I will get it. Okay. So that, what, is, that is what I, I I would say. Okay, so we're similar then to the spin to the spin part, the spin of the coupling part. Okay, very good. Oh, wonderful. Um, yeah, a lot of food for thought. Uh, lots of uh, things. Uh, it's so yeah, there's so many things to catch up with. Yeah, <laughs> it's it's a very rich field. Yes, it's, 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 uh, yeah. You cannot possibly know everything that everybody's done, and it's, it's fascinating to see uh, all of it. Let me double check to see if there's anybody asking. Oh, so yeah. Uh, so, Mark, you had a short question. Let me, uh, let me uh, if you have still time. Uh, can, can you unmute yourself, yeah. Mark? Yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah, there you go. There you are. Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry. Sorry. Okay. Uh, I have a small, short question. Let you return to the Hamiltonian. I'm going there. It, it takes a little while, but um, I'm going there. <laughs> uh, he, he, uh, this one? This one. Yeah. We have uh, sigma by B exchange. Okay. Uh, hey, uh, sigma... Sorry, you, you, uh, this term, yes? Yes. Yes. B exchange. Hmm? Uh, this term does not... Uh, does not commute with uh, spin density. Uh, imagine that you have no uh, spin orbital and relativistic interactions. Uh, spin density in the itinerant system commutes with uh, the Coulomb Hamiltonian. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I, I think that the introduction of this Hamiltonian may introduce uh, ghost, ghost effects. Okay. But I, I am not sure. Uh, um, it's a, a point of... Uh, um, okay, so um, now it, it, this becomes very fundamental indeed. Uh, because if we would switch off relativistic effects, then this goes away, green block, blue block, this goes away. Actually, this also, everything disappears, yeah? Yes. And then I have the normal kind of uh, equation uh, that I'm solving in DFT. Yes. Yeah, so uh, if your point is right, what would it mean for DFT calculations? Yeah, they, they would be uh, ill-founded. No, I don't think so. I think that... Uh... The calculations you you talk about is a calculation for for wave function. Yeah, okay. Uh, but spin density is binary binary mm -hmm. operator mm -hmm. commutes with initial Newtonian. Could you? Uh, I I've, it's only science fiction. You obtain some equations. And on on some level, it, it they will be exact, but on on lower level, you you involve the the calculation of wave function in density. Um, okay. Because, because your your um, equation, your, here, your equation here, here is density matrix, yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, but we we do not explicitly evaluate the density matrix. Okay, but but I mean that uh, just on the level of equation of motions, mm -hmm. uh, you have a S cross B exchange that should not be. It should it should appear afterwards. I don't know. It's only only intuitive. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so it um, B exchange is one part here. Yes, but but okay. If I, I don't have uh, 
objections. Okay. Okay. As, as, as the presider says, there are many, many food for thinking. Many, exactly. <laughs> right? Yes. Okay. Usually Thank Peter you. brings a lot of thought. <laughs> So, yeah, the, the, um, I'm happy about that. That we uh, it, it leads to some discussion. Uh, also, I would la like to ask uh, if hard refoc can be used instead of density functional theory for for this mm -hmm. in your scheme. Okay. Uh, uh, um, I cannot definitely say yes. It might be possible, uh, but but we have not uh, done it. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank uh, you. Let me see. Is uh, I'm not sure if there's another one with Anna Santalov. Let me just uh, and then we'll, that will be the last question maybe. Um, do you have uh, a question, Santalov, or just? Go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead. Can you hear me? Yeah, I'm going to hear you. Okay. Hello, Peter. Hey, Igor. Uh, yeah. Uh, so actually, uh, all this, this discussion uh, connected uh, with uh, uh, taking into account of symmetry of uh, indistinguishable, uh, of uh, symmetry of the wave function of indistinguishable particles. And uh, oh. you have in these equations kind of decoupling. So yeah. it kind of mean field theory. Yeah. And therefore, uh, actually, you cannot require uh, strict derivation from density matrix to this field, because uh, you always have a coupling with uh, correlation functions. Uh, if you write uh, uh, this equation for many electrons, you will have many particle uh, wave function. Mm -hmm. And there arises immediately exchange interaction and so on, only due to symmetry of wave function. Mm -hmm. So I think that yeah. it's very difficult to go uh, from uh, this derivation uh, yeah. to, to compare with uh, right. microscopics. Right. Okay. Because in this case, you have to uh, uh, couple mm -hmm. self energy with exchange correlation potential, which you did not discuss at all. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, okay. So it's just coming. Uh, yes, uh, okay, so so basically then, uh, uh, let me see if I can go back here. Okay, no, here's not. Yes, uh, it, it brings us to the, the Hamiltonian and the treatment. Yeah, because it is indeed, it is mean field here. Yeah. That is correct. Um, and as you know, the nonetheless um, uh, cone sham, uh, it would give the right result for the ground state. Okay. Um, but uh, there might be something missing, which is not the ground state. I think that is, uh, that is fair to say that. Um, so if I want to go beyond mean field, um, that would be a very difficult, uh, mathematical construction that is the first uh, thing uh, i don't know where it it it, it could be better yes uh, i don't know where it will lead us um it it might lead to to a reasonable result at, at the moment i cannot say it um but it is correct to to point out the the limitations of the approach yeah well uh, uh, what i wanted to say that actually all this discussion about place where you have to put exchange interaction and so mm -hmm. on uh, will uh, arise in this, uh, let us say, diagrammatic derivation. So it, it appears itself. But uh, of course, uh, it's very difficult uh, step mm -hmm. to go yeah. to uh, yeah. density functional. This is main problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So. Um, to go to a higher level, yeah, diagrammatic expansions would make it much more involved uh, and complex. Yeah. Um, um, so, so I'm, 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 I'm not going to do it. Um, 
<laughs> but but uh, in principle, it it could lead to something to to an approach that is better founded. If you talk uh, about the wave function, yeah, I think that in the mean field approach that we have here, I would consider it uh, sufficient. Um, but it's possible that one. Well, I, if you want to do it in, in a very fundamental way, uh, one could consider to go beyond it. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Igor. Okay. So with this, I think, uh, well, thank you, uh, Peter. Uh, uh, Juan David, do you have any other comments? Uh, I see you have- yeah, just, just very, very short one. Um, so since I'm, I'm trying to tackle this uh, a similar problem with one of my students, Professor Peter. So yeah. I was very curious uh, when Sumi 